nanogram is, is what we use to measure the activity of hormones. It's a billionth of a gram. And um, so uh, like a, a granule of salt would have 58,000 nanograms. That, that would be the weight of a granule of salt. So um, this is not a nanogram, these are M&Ms. Um, but this is the equivalent, a unimplanted steer, beef steer, would have six nanograms of estrogen per pound of meat. So that's, that's not a whole lot. You know, you could look at, uh, you know, that's a very small unit of measure. If we look at an implanted steer um, compared to the unimplanted steer, that's 14 nanograms. So we did increase the estrogen in that beef per pound, but maybe double. You know, there's quite a few more M&Ms in there. Um, so we can't deny that we do increase it. But what is, what is most of our hamburger made from? Cull cows, right? So an open cow, naturally occurring estrogen in that cow would have 31 nanograms of estrogen activity in, in that pound of beef. So, you know, um, and most of our slaughter heifers would be an open female. By the time they slaughter them, they'll be over a year old, so they'll probably be cycling, and they would have equivalent amounts of, of estrogen in their meat. So there is an estrogen in meat, and um, that's something we can talk about. But uh, if we had a pound of peas, that's 330 M&Ms in there, we would have 330 nanograms of estrogen in a pound of peas. So that's 10 times more than, you know, the highest amount in that beef we were just talking about. Okay, so peas have it too. I see what you're getting at. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, when we get into, uh, say, cabbage, there's 11,000 nanograms. Is that the same, basically the same type of estrogen? Yeah, so the estrogenic activity would be equivalent or a little bit more on a lot of these uh, plant types. So cabbage would have 11,000 nanograms in a pound of cabbage. So there'd be 22 more of these, or 22 times more than what I have in my hands here. So you know, there's really not any kind of health concern or um, concern feeding our children beef that's been implanted because the, the estrogen in it is, is just not that uh, large an amount. Uh, most of our implants have estrogenic activity. The original one, and I just thought this was cool when we were looking around the animal science department. This is, uh, the original one was DES or diethylstabestrol. Um, and it was uh, highly effective. They started using it in the 50s and it was banned in the 70s because uh, there was, uh, they had found in some lab rodents, you know, it, it did have uh, carcinogenic effects at a very high dose. There wasn't that much that wound up in the meat, but it was banned anyway, just from safety concerns. So on this, it was one pellet. It would work into that gun and each pellet would, would supply that implant. So it was a highly uh, effective implant. We would get about two-tenths of a pound of added gain per day on either a calf or a grazing animal, uh, up to nearly a half a pound per day added on a feedlot animal. Uh, Four-tenths is the average I saw. Um, this is the original Rougro in the same type of container. Worked the same way. And uh, it was a lower potency type implant. And we get about a tenth of a pound per day on a, on a suckling calf, uh, maybe 15 hundredths of a pound a day. Uh, on a grazing steer, you're, you know, we may get two tenths of a pound added gain from that. Uh, here's the uh, current Railgro implant. They went to this you know, back in the 70s, and it's, this is currently the way it is sold. Uh, notice it's a fairly simple gun, similar to that one. Um, you just advance that yourself. It's simple. You get this sub-Q in under the skin in the ear and uh, all that. So in the, it wasn't until in the mid-90s 
that we finally started getting implants that were equivalent to what we were able to get with the diethylus dibestrol. The uh, feedlot implants today, Revlor uh, IS, it's a modern potency feedlot implant that you'd give early in the uh, feeding period. It's got four pellets that have testosterone and estrogen in it. Um, the Revlor G would just have three pellets. So it'd be very similar to what we would do, give to a grazing animal. Here's the same compound, the same type of pellet with the Revlor 200, and that's a more higher potency, longer acting implant for later in the feeding season. Um, <clears throat> one point to, to make is we have different types of implant guns, and every brand has a different gun. So this is what we would use with, with this one here. Um, load it from the bottom and it advances as, as we go. Um, the component from Elanco has a similar type of uh, deal, but it's a, just a different way to, to load it. So you can't use different brands of products unless you have the gun for that different. So another modern potency implant would be this uh, Computose. It's a 200 day implant we would use for light grazing steers. Um, and the reason how they can make it a 200 day implant is it's contained in a silicone gel um, and it is uh, eaten away from either side. But if you are implanting a two or 300 pound weaned steer, their ears are gonna be quite a bit smaller. That's a pretty good sized implant to, to use in there. Uh, once again, another a fairly simple gun. Um, so we, we need to match the, the application with the type of implant we're using. Um, Ralgro is labeled for pre-weaning and post-weaning. Uh, component C or Cinevex C, here's a um, component I don't have any Cinevex. They're labeled for pre-weaning calves. They're uh, essentially the same implant as this uh, component ES, only there'd be fewer pellets, and it only lasts about 70 days. The Ralgro, that's a smaller implant, plant, low potency, would last about 70 days. And for the, the implants for the pre-weaning plant, what would you expect, what results would you expect to see? We normally see, we expect about 22 pounds added gain from implanting at about three months of age until weaning. So it's about a 10% 10, 10 increase in uh, gain, uh, about 15 hundredths of a pound of gain, 0.15 pounds per day increased gain. Uh, this, this implant or the Cinevex C would cost less than a dollar. So we're, if we're talking 20 to 30 you know, pounds of gain and the and it's worth a dollar fifty, you know, that's thirty extra dollars for a dollar. And and that's usually the return on investment on implants we see is about uh, thirty uh, times return on on that operation. You know, it doesn't go away right away, but it starts going down. Um, the problem we have is um, in most operations, you know, if you give a low potency implant pre-weaning, then they go to a moderate potency implant at a stalker phase, um, you lose the, the added gain, you know, you retain the gain advantage, they don't lose that 20 pounds advantage over the unimplanted animal. Um, but you lose the gain advantage. So the feedlots, they, they want that implant in that animal until basically the day they leave the feedlot for harvest. Um, there is no withdrawal on, on the implants. You know, these are ears from a slaughter plant and we don't use the ears for, for any red meat. Uh, there's no food uh, market. market for ears. Here we want it in the middle third of the ear and usually right in here in this trough area is the easiest place to give it. But that's also where we want to put our permanent ear tags. All the research on heifers, you need to identify when and, and, and what animals you're going to implant. If you implant at birth, and there are operations that when they catch the cattle and, and work them, they will implant the day after birth. 
We do get a gain advantage by weaning, but it will decrease heifer fertility. If you wait until three to four months after birth, you can get the weight advantage on those heifers and not really impact. You may have a 1% percentage unit decrease in heifer pregnancy, which is real hard to measure if we implant in that window. You don't want to give them the second implant. Um, there's not a huge response on heifer fertility if we give one at weaning, but it is 8 to 10% decrease in fertility. So you can implant a heifer with one of these lower potency implants three months after birth. Um, you know, I usually will not do it to heifers just because I don't want to take that risk, but uh, there are people that have been very successful with that. Being a clean needle in a clean injection site, um, there are some products, this component brand, they have one pellet of antibiotic that goes with that to keep an infection from occurring. Um, if you have an inf infection occur, it will wall off, turn into an abscess, um, and the swelling will do one of two things. It'll keep the, either keep the implant from getting absorbed into the body, or it'll just go ahead and push the, the uh, implant out of the ear. I've had a lot more trouble with, with these type, where it's uh, one whole unit, you know, that, that swelling will just push that implant out. Um, one simple concept to use is just put some novel sand and a set of septic solution in a paint tray, have some paint rollers or a sponge, and just in between each one, uh, you just clean that needle off. And if the, if, you know, running cattle through a chute, we always could get some fecal material or something on that ear. If it's real bad, we can clean that off with a paper towel and use some of this solution and, and get a clean site. And that doesn't take much time. It's just slowing down and making sure you're doing it right.